So it's it's pretty much like like when you go to a movie theater, you you're going to watch a movie. It's already been shot. It's in the can. It's being projected. You can't change what happens in the movie. I mean, they are actually are coming out with some movies now where you have little <laughs> things and you know this and this. But but for this metaphor, <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about the last decades of of film. <laughs> black and white and so on. So you, you can't change it. You, people do talk to the screen, like, don't go down that hall and don't go in there. Don't get away from him. You know, they talk, <laughs> you know, it's a bunch of images on the screen, but they're talking as if they're real people because that's the whole mesmerism of this world. Forget that you're dreaming, watching a movie, and become so identified with the characters now that you really believe they're real characters that can hear you. Jesus even talks about it in the Course, you know, you, you talk to those who are not there, he says in his workbook, and those who are not there seem to answer you. Even in the most simple thing, hi, how are you doing? Hmm, not bad. Aha, <laughs> he goes sitting back there going, ha, I got you again. You think you're having a real conversation with somebody there and you're just asleep and dreaming watching a movie and forgotten completely that you made the movie up and that you're not even a character on that movie. Just like when you're watching a movie in a theater, you, you, know, you, don't, you don't expect the characters to change, the movie to change. Like, oh yeah, I went to see uh, Time Traveler's Wife and instead of just talking about the movie and your reactions and responses and everything, you say, yeah, no, I, I decided to play the movie out different. <laughs> In my version of the movie, <laughs> Time Traveler's Wife, then, you know, they get married and they go to the, the, the planet Zorbo and they live forever. Uh, and, and, well, that's not my version of the movie. I decided to do it a lot different. I had him disappear at the end and da 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 da. You know, it's, we, we are talking about it as if it's, it's, a, it's a movie. It's been shot and in the movie is the movie. You can't change the movie. But again, how different this is from everyday experience when you're trying to fix and change the movie or under the guise of making a happy dream or a better dream, you work very hard to try to change the dream, to have a better life. You know, like the Horatio Alger story, you know, pull yourselves up from your disadvantaged past and make something of, of it. You know, that was even a slogan as I was growing up of the the army, be all that you can be. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> yeah, I think I have better aspirations <laughs> than going around gunning down people in other countries. But, but still, it was the whole thing. It was no di different than trying to improve your life, improve your circumstances. And all the work and energy that comes in to striving to have a better life. And all of it's for naught because still you're dreaming a dream and if you actually begin to grasp this, you will soon get over self-improvement. You will soon get over trying to make the world a better place uh, or making the world better and all the work. And just think about the social services and world hunger. What do you mean? Who, who invented world hunger? It's, that's part of a dream. You know, nuclear proliferation, f fight to save the whales, save the dolphins. You know, all the things that people try to do. Eat better. You, if you eat better, you go organic. What does it matter? It's a dream. It's a dream. It's not going to help. The only thing you can do with a nightmare is forgive it, see it without judgment, see it simultaneous instead of linear, and wake up from it and go back to your eternal nature which is pure bliss. People say, that sounds boring. That's too boring. <laughs> it's not boring, I am tell you. It is not boring. <laughs> it, is, it is joyful. It's not boring at all. Yes? I don't get when you say, you just ask, enlightenment's not in the script. But this for me is a very slow process here. So if, it's, if I'm living the illusion, but it's slow process and where I'm learning and learning, then it is changing, isn't it? I mean, the more I react differently for this person, then that day I'm going to have a happier day. So it's, the script is changing, isn't it? Or not? It's not. It just it, it seems to be interpreted, 
you know, you we get words like I'm more peaceful than I was before. I tell you, nothing is a matter of more or less. Nothing. Everything is absolute. You know, there's the the old thing that used to come from Christianity, you know, it's all or nothing. It's all or nothing. And, all, and I used to hate that. I used to say, Oh, come on, all or nothing, black and white. Ah, da, 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 da. Guess what? <laughs> Guess what? Who gets to swallow eat crow? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it is all or nothing. And truth is not a matter of degrees, little increments and moments and so forth. It's like the truth is true and only the truth is true. And we start to see that, that uh, when you finally make it back to the beyond all idols section in the Course, way kind of towards the back of the text, Jesus starts off the section, What is an idol do you think you know? He asked a question. An idol is for more of something. It does not matter more of what. It does not matter more of what. Even peace of mind. Yeah. It does not matter more of what. So, so the awakening is not in the script. The awakening is a change in the perspective on the script from linear to simultaneous. So that's that's what we're talking about. And a lot of times people will talk about, well, what about enlightened beings? Like, what about like Jesus? You know, <laughs> that seemed to be in the script. It seemed to be a point where he started talking like he wasn't a human being anymore. Before Abraham was, I am. You know, but remember, it's the man wasn't enlightened because the man is just a mask. Enlightenment isn't male or female. Enlightenment isn't masculine or feminine. Those are still dualistic concepts that are projected onto the screen. And enlightenment itself has nothing to do with masculine or feminine or male or female. Even people like Mary Baker Eddy who came and taught these glorious truths, you know, they would, they would try to, you know, bring in rituals into the church that she founded. And one of those rituals was they had a man and a woman speaking in the front. You see, it's kind of like, this is a symbol of equality. And then they had, they were more like the readers. And then they, when they would read, what they would read would be Father, Mother, God. God isn't a father or a mother. Those are dualistic terminologies. Those were just symbols that they were trying to use to, to give a sense that it's equal. It's not one better than another. It's just purely equal. Um, you know, I go all over the world in 28 countries, and it's very, very rare, uh, actually, over that, like, the spinning world, when I go around, and sp I meet thousands of people, tens of thousands of people, and it's very, very, very rare when I talk about this world as a dream. In fact, uh, in uh, the Gospel of Thomas, uh, Jesus had, had told Thomas, uh, don't don't mention that this is a like a desert or a dream or it'll bring fire down on our heads. So I meet tens of thousands of people and and I meet them on subways and airplanes and basements, like I said, bookstores. I meet them in all different countries and all different languages and everything. And it's very rare, the percentage of my time, of talking about what I'm talking about now. However, this is a Course in Miracles gathering and we are correcting error from the bottom up, not from the top down. I would say probably if you know my teachings and the people, messengers that I work with, we actually have come up with terminology for what that kind of denial you're talking about. We call it metaphysical ghosting. Uh, it's all an illusion, it's all an illusion, it's all an illusion. Oh, that's, you know, you have to, you have to f see that for yourself. You have to have an experience. It takes an enormous amount of mind training and we actually have developed online program called Mystical Mind Training Program where we use movies like this, we use meditations, we use all kinds of exercises, and our whole approach all these years has been cor correcting error from the bottom up. And so we are talking about the metaphysics today in the context of this, and we are starting off this gathering, unlike a lot of gatherings that I've done over these many, many years, where we, we just do Q&A, we always approach things from where people, as I said earlier, are coming from with what they believe. And um, I'm always getting questions too about um, 
the inappropriate use of denial. In other words, to, to, to deny the body is the inappropriate use of denial. Deny, Jesus says, what is the appropriate or helpful use of denial? Deny the belief that error can hurt you. That's what Jesus calls the appropriate use of denial. So we're always taking it back to the perception in mind, to the idea that there's something outside that can actually harm, whether it's particular kinds of food or radiation or uh, weather conditions or so on and so forth. But it's, it's a really deep mind training process and, and we are always telling people, don't think you can just skip over anything and click your heels together Instead of saying there's no place like home, it's just all an illusion. Because I would say that's probably the number one misuse of, uh, of A Course in Miracles. Mm. Jesus didn't go around and during his three years of uh, public ministry uh, just telling everybody it was all a dream and it was an illusion. But for those that, that have stayed with me and worked with me over these decades and so forth, you know, we're getting down to the nitty gritty. Yeah, people are always saying me, what's the most essential thing that I need to recognize? Where, if I tune into the Holy Spirit, which is really all the Course is doing, is helping you tune into your own internal teacher. You know, that's all it's really doing. But when I do tune in to that internal teacher, what is that internal teacher going to do with me? <laughs> you know, what, what, what am I going to be guided to do? And the Holy Spirit works, you know, as Ken Wapnick has said, it works in the mind not in the world. The Holy Spirit is not, you can interpret that the Holy Spirit is bringing you parking spaces and giving you all these kind of things, checks in the mail and this and this, but those are, are wonderful little signs and symbols along the way that are very encouraging. You know, when you pray for help uh, with something practical and you seem to get a check in the mail or an unexpected kind of thing that comes out of nowhere, that can be very encouraging, but it still shouldn't be a reason to believe that, that the Holy Spirit is tinkering around in the dream. So there's been a lot of wonderful teachings and teachers that have really pointed that out. So what we're really looking at is uh, when you get all the way to the back of the text of A Course in Miracles, Jesus says, Salvation is nothing more than the escape from concepts. And he also talks about exchanging self-concepts. That's the Holy Spirit's job. So nothing is ripped away. The, the tablecloth is not pulled out. We, we seem to go through an experience while we believe in the reality of the world to more expansive self-concepts. And they still involve time and space components of them and those are very, very practical. So um, I would say that even to be a miracle worker that I talked about last night or a teacher of God, those are still concepts. But the more you just give yourself over to those concepts, you find that they're very expansive self-concepts, much more expansive than father, mother, sister, brother, or construction worker, or you know, whatever. It's, it's approaching the I amness. But before you reach the I amness, you reach forgiveness which is really the forgiven world or the happy dream. And that's the goal of the Course. It's really to, it's, it's not the abstract I amness, but it's to have the happy dream and do that. On the surface, when we kind of come zooming in with all of you, <laughs> something like this, you could be like, whoa, what is, are, we, are we going for Z here, Z? <laughs> in a way we are, because in a way we want to save, save time or we want we want the mind to experience the fullness of the glory that it is as soon as possible, but it has to be a, a careful undoing and you have to literally allow the darkness to come up into the mind and have that mind shift. You can't, you can't just, you know, we're not here teaching Diksha, we're not here teaching the, the Darshan. What we're really into is bringing the illusions to the truth. We're not trying a top-down approach of, we don't have any magic wands hidden anywhere, at the end we're going to bonk you all on the head and go, okay, enough of this stuff, wake up, you know. We don't have any kind of magical things here. We're, we're really talking about doing the inner work of bringing the darkness to the light and bringing the illusions to the truth.